What's up guys? Welcome back to basic probability of a chance event. This is part two. In the previous video, we learned an awful lot about simulations and experimental probability. But to be honest, that's not most fun thing in the world to do. So now let's talk about theoretical probability. All right, here's the big idea. The true real probability of any event will never be known until a large number of trials are conducted. And I mean a large number. And this is something that you really have to wrap your heads around. And even kids that think they understand probability sometimes don't understand this true definition of probability. <coughs> so here comes another big um, definition alert, right? In red, the true probability of an event or outcome would be the relative frequency of that outcome over an infinite number of trials, which we would call the long run. The long run meaning we do it over and over and over and over again. So let me try to make sense of this through tossing a coin. Everybody and their brother knows that the probability that you toss a coin and you get a tail is 50%, 50%. But what does that 50% mean? What does that probability represent? And that's where a lot of kids don't understand. Some kids will say, oh, it means that if I toss a coin two times, one out of two will be tails. No, that's not what it means. Well, if I toss a coin 10 times, five will be tails. No, that's not what it means. It means that if you were to toss a coin a large number of times, infinite trials, to be quite honest, right? The true probability of an event will never be known until you do an infinite number of trials. Only then can you sit there and say, okay, of those infinite number of trials, I saw a tail 50% of the time. So this is really, really, really important to understand that theoretical probability is saying, hey, you could do an experiment all you want. You could do five trials, you could do 100 trials, and you're gonna get an experimental probability from that simulation. Or if you actually sit and toss a coin 100 times, you're gonna get an experimental probability. Like you might sit and toss a coin 100 times and get 60 tails. That does not mean that the theoretical true probability is 60%, absolutely not because this is the idea. The true probability of an event will only reveal itself in the long run, a large number, infinite per se, number of trials. All right, now I do have a rule down here in blue, and that is just making sure that everybody understands probability has to be a number between zero and one. Probability um, cannot be negative. Probability cannot be more than one. Probability um, is a proportion. It's a proportion, meaning it's a number between zero and one. Um, we often do change it to a percentage. So the probability might be 0.13, but we, we write that as 13%. That's okay. So as a percentage, probability is between zero and 100%. But as a decimal proportion, it's between zero and one. You cannot have a probability more than 100%, cannot have a probability less than zero. All right, now this brings up something really, really important. It's called the law of large numbers. This is basically what is telling us what probability means. So simulated probabilities will get closer to the true probability as the number of trials increase. So in all the examples we did in the previous video, we only did a, a certain number of trials because I couldn't do infinite. I didn't have time to do infinite. So I did five or 10 or six or whatever. But again, the true probability will never reveal itself until you do a large amount of trials. You have to do a lot, like a large, large, large amount, right? So even if you do five trials, you're gonna get an experimental probability or a simulated probability, but it's not going to be true until we keep doing more and more trials. So the more trials that you conduct, the closer you will get to finding the true probability of an event. Now, in contrast, if we only run a small amount of trials, we're not going to expect to get the true probability. I'm sorry. So if you go back to any of the examples we did in the previous video, you know, it, it's just not going to be true that we're finding the true probability if we only do a couple trials. You need to do, honestly, a lot. It's called the law of large numbers. Large, infinite, many, 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 many trials. All right, now, there is some people who believe in what's called the law of averages. I actually cross this out because this is completely false. This is the false principle that supposes most future events are likely to balance any past deviation from a presumed average. 
Now you might be like, what? Okay, so here's an example. Somebody might say, oh my gosh, the coin has been a tail for five straight tosses. A head is more likely to come up next. No, no, a coin doesn't have a brain. It, no, it's just not true. Just because you haven't seen a head come up yet, doesn't mean it one's more likely. So the law of averages is this false principle that it's gonna average out. So if you toss 20 coins and you get 12 tails, well, if you toss the 20 more, it'll average back out that way you have 50-50. No, that's not necessarily true. Um, it's the same thing, you know, gamblers will do this. Oh, I'm on a hot streak. Oh, I'm doing really well. I'm throwing my die and I keep getting a good number. I keep winning and winning. No, okay, well, listen, every time you throw that die, the die doesn't have a brain, the probability doesn't go up or go down just because you're doing well. Um, if you are into sports, you could even think about a baseball player. You could say, oh, that baseball player hasn't gotten a hit in five at-bats. He's due to get a hit. No, right? That's just not how it works. Things don't just average out because they're supposed to. So the law of averages is not true. What's true is the law of large numbers. The true probability of an event will only be seen if you do it a whole bunch of times, over and over and over again. All right, so let's look at some examples so you like really understand this, right? So again, notice I'm trying to use my new symbols here. So P for probability, proportion, percentage, all the same thing. So what's the probability a coin lands on a head? Well, 50%. What does that mean? Again, you gotta be able to explain this. It means if I were to toss a coin a large number of times, in after a large number of tosses, only then would I expect to actually see 50% of those tosses be hit. What's the probability that um, you approach a, uh, a traffic light and when you go underneath that traffic light, it's green? And maybe you find out that it's 23%. Well, again, what does that 23% mean? It means that after a large, large, large number of times passing and passing and passing through that traffic light, 23% of the time, it was a green light, okay? Um, maybe you roll a die. What's the probability you roll a die? D for die, and that die shows a three on the top face. Well, um, one-sixth. Hopefully you guys know how to figure that out, right? There's six sides to a die, one of them's a three. So there's a one-sixth probability, which can be made into a proportion, of course, 0.167, which would be 16.7%. So what does that mean? Well, it means if you roll a die many, 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 many times, over and over and over and over and over again, only in the long run will we actually see a three come up 16.7% of the time. Most kids will say, no, 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 no. That means that if you roll a die six times, one of them will be a three. No, that's the short run. Six tosses? That's a short number of trials. The probability, true probability, happens after a large number of trials. Please make sure you truly understand that. All right, a couple more terms coming at you fast. All right, sample space. A sample space is a list of all possible outcomes. Now, sometimes that list is pretty short, Sometimes that list can be pretty long. It all depends. We're going to kind of explore more and more and more as we learn more of this unit. Now, a probability distribution table is actually pretty nice. A probability distribution table is simply a list of all the outcomes. So it's like partly a sample space. But then next to each outcome is the probability of that outcome. So here are two probability distribution tables, just so you kind of understand what they look like. So in uh, blue here on the left, I have on the left side, hey, you toss a coin, what could happen? Well, it could be a head or it could be a tail. Those are the only two things that could happen when you toss a coin. And then next to them, I have the probability, 50% um, for tail, 50% for head. Uh, on the left here, excuse me, on the right in red, uh, hey, you go underneath the traffic light, what could happen when you pass underneath that traffic light? Well, it's green. 23% of the time, it's red 74% of the time, and it's yellow 3% of the time. But again, how did I come up with these numbers? After a large, 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 large number of trials. Now, another rule coming at you here. All probabilities in a probability distribution must add up to one. So in any probability distribution table that I ever give you, the probabilities better add up to one. If they don't add up to one, something's going on. And it's because something has to happen, right? Right? When you go underneath the red light, or excuse me, not a red light, a traffic light, something has to happen. 
Well, there's only three things that can happen. So those three things better have probabilities that add up to one because that will account for every possibility that can happen. Same thing with tossing a coin. So hopefully that makes a lot of sense. So these are kind of two terms that you need to be able to know because we're gonna be dealing with a lot of sample spaces and a lot of probability distribution tables. Okay, so can two outcomes happen at once? So now we're still talking about a chance event, but you know, could two outcomes happen at the same time? Okay, well, that's a great question. So this actually brings up a new definition. When two events cannot occur at the same time, we call them mutually exclusive events, two events that cannot occur at the same time. So for example, a traffic light cannot be red, green, and yellow at the same time. It cannot be any three or two colors at the same time. So traffic light, red and green are mutually exclusive events. Tossing a coin, a coin cannot be a head and tail at the same time. So that's a mutually exclusive event. Um, marble. You pick a marble out of a bag and they're all solid colors. You can't get a blue and a green marble at the same time. That would be impossible. You only pick it out one marble. It could be blue or it could be green. So this is um, mutually exclusive events, two events that cannot happen at the same time. So generically, what we say here is that the probability of A and B is zero, meaning it can't happen. You cannot get A and B to happen at the same time. Those are mutually exclusive events. Two events that cannot happen at the same trial. The same trial. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. So not mutually exclusive would be, well, the opposite. Not mutually exclusive means that they can happen at the same time. So let's give a really simple example about this. All right. Let's let D be the chance event of what you have for dinner on Thanksgiving. So what are you having for dinner? What's the main course at your dinner table? for Thanksgiving. Well, turkey. Turkey's a pretty big one, right? So let's say that we know the probability that there's turkey on a table is 62%. So this means that we looked at many, 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 many tables. Thanksgiving, many, many, many families, many, many, many get-togethers, large number, right? And 62% of them had turkey on that table. Well, we also looked at ham. We said, hey, is there, is there ham on your table? And we looked at many, 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 you could have both on your table, right? One table, one get together, one trial, one dinner, one family could have turkey and ham on their table table at the same time. That that would be possible. So these are not mutually exclusive. And um, we found after looking at many, 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 many tables that 7%, 0.07, percent of tables had both. And obviously, if you start to really think about this, some tables have turkey, some tables have ham, some tables have both. Well, some tables could actually have neither. And we're going to talk about that now. So let's actually explore this. Now, one great way to explore mutually exclusive events or non-mutually exclusive events would be with what's called a Venn diagram. A Venn diagram is um, a box. So the box, the black box represents your sample space, everything that can happen. And in that sample space is your possible outcomes. So let's let the red circle be those that have turkey for Thanksgiving, turkey on their table, and the blue circle be ham. Now, <clears throat> notice how these two circles are overlapping. That's because we were told that 7%, 0.07, 7% of families have both. So that's the overlap, right? Those are the families that have both turkey and ham on their dinner table at the same time. Now, the red circle is turkey. And we were told that 62% of families have turkey. So the entire red circle has to add up to 62%. So this is where we got to really understand what's going on here. The section over here, and I, I can't really, this section over here, right? The section that would, if you think about it, would be specifically turkey, no ham. So it's the part of the red circle that is separate from the blue circle. So that would be turkey and no ham. That's very, very specific. Turkey and no ham. The entire red circle is turkey. The part on the left would be turkey and no ham. 
So this is actually pretty easy to figure out. If the entire turkey circle is 62% and 7% is being overlapped with ham, then do 62 minus 7, and we would get 55% have only turkey, turkey and no ham. So it'd be 0.55. So again, the entire red circle does add up to that 62%, but 7% also has ham, where 55% only has turkey, no ham. That's very specific. And I can do the same thing for the ham. Remember, 35% of families had ham, but 7% also had turkey. So 35 minus 7 leaves me with 28% or 0.28 that had ham and no turkey, right? So you have to be very specific in what you're saying. If all you're doing is saying turkey, hey, turkey, who has turkey on their table? You're looking at the 62% total in that red circle. Hey, do you have ham? It's 35% total in the blue circle. But then when you start to be more specific, hey, do you have both ham and turkey? That's the 7% in the middle. Do you have turkey, but, 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 but no ham? That's the 55%. Ham, but no turkey, that's the 28%. Now, the outside would be the neither. No turkey, no ham. So if I take 100, because 100%, right, something has to be on your dinner table for Thanksgiving, subtract the 55, subtract the 7, subtract the 28. What we get left is that 10% or 0 0.10, 10% of people had neither. No turkey, no ham, right? So again, I'm just kind of looking at the four regions of this Venn diagram, right? You got to understand the four regions. You got the overlap in the middle. That's the 7% that have both. You got the section on the far left of the red circle that was only turkey. Far right of the blue circle, only ham. And then the outside would be everything else. That would be neither. No turkey, no ham, certainly not both. So that's what we came up with here. Now, one other way to organize this, Venn diagrams are really nice, but if you're looking for another way to organize this, this is with um, a nice kind of two-way table-ish going on here. So what happens is I filled in everything that was originally told to me. So on the left-hand side here, I have, yes, I have turkey. No, I do not on my dining room table. So if you kind of cover up for a second the middle, right? And you say, okay, at the very far right here, 62% said, yes, we have turkey, which automatically tells me, with just doing a little bit of math, that 38% no turkey, right? 62% had turkey, 38% did not. Come on, simple math. All right, then what we have across the top is ham. Yes, I had ham. No, I did not have ham. So 35% of people said, yes, I have ham for Thanksgiving, which means that 65% said, no, I do not have ham, no ham on my dinner table. Okay, then we were also told that the overlap, the yes turkey and yes ham was 0.07 right here. So now with just some really simple math, I could fill in the rest of the box here. So the yes ham has to add up to 35%. So that would be the 28% right here. That would be yes ham, and no turkey, right? Following my logic there. Then if I'm looking at the turkey, yes, turkey, um, 62 minus seven would lead me with the 55% that were yes, turkey and no ham. And then of course, the remaining here, and you can find this too, is you can look at the no ham or the no turkey, but again, it's gotta add up to 38% um, horizontally or vertically gotta add up to 65%. That would be the 10% that had neither, no turkey, no ham. And it really just took some simple math to figure out those numbers. It was really just basically subtraction, right? It's not that difficult. So this actually leads me to a new rule. Um, the opposite of an event is just one minus that event. So if you have the probability of turkey, one minus the probability of turkey would be the opposite, no turkey. We call that actually the complement, not a, not a, um, big guy, not a big thing for you to remember the word compliment, but it's just the opposite. So if we're saying, hey, 62% of people have turkey, well, then the compliment would just be the opposite, one minus that, 38% do not. So nice, really simple way to fill in this table and understand what all of these specific um, proportions or percentages or probabilities represent. And really understanding every single one of them is very, very crucial, okay? Very, very crucial. All right, so this brings up a whole nother topic, right? Everything's kind of 
escalating towards each other here. I like how everything connects. And this brings up this idea of and versus or. Now, when we, when we say find the probability, find the percentage, find the proportion, P for whatever, find the probability that A and B, we're looking for the occurrence of both A and B occurring at the same time. So the phrase A and B can only be satisfied if both occur. It's very, very specific. Whereas if we say find the probability of A or B, now this could actually mean several different outcomes. This is where you gotta really understand the phrase A or B. This means either A or B or both. So the phrase or A or B can be satisfied if A occurs, B occurs, or both occur. You know, for example, right now, if we're looking at a classroom of students, and I'd say, raise your hand if you're a boy and you have glasses. That is very specific. The only people that can raise their hand are boys who also, both boys, and they're wearing glasses. The only people that can raise their hand. Whereas if I say, raise your hand if you're a boy or you wear glasses, well, that means anybody that's a boy can raise their hand. Anybody that's wearing glasses, even if you're a girl, as long as you're wearing glasses, because I said boy or glasses. So as long as you're wearing glasses, you could raise your hand. But it also means that anybody with both is raising their hand. Because if you're a boy and you have glasses, well, you're still going to raise your hand because you were a boy or you had glasses. So you actually had both of them, but you're still raising your hand. So A or B actually references all three, A, B, or both. Whereas A and B is literally only both. Now, um, I put at the bottom here, it's worth noting that the opposite of A or B is neither, right? A or B is going to be turkey or ham or even both. Well, the opposite of A or B would be neither, nothing, ni neither of them. So that's an important thing to remember as well. All right, let's look at another example of this just to try to try to put all this together. All right, so this is uh, two-way tables really make this kind of nice and simple. So here's a two-way table. Uh, I did stick with glasses, but this time I added not gender, but um, what grade you're in, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. So we looked at 500 students and we simply said, all right, what's your grade level? What are you wearing? Do you wear glasses or do you not? So we've all dealt with two-way tables before, but check this out. You know, I could ask all kinds of really cool questions with this. Hey, what's the probability that you wear glasses? What's the probability that I close my eyes, blindfold myself, randomly reach into these 500 students and pull out a student that wears glasses? Well, um, 142 kids wear glasses out of 500. Boom, there's my proportion. There's my probability. How easy was that? Um, I could say, hey, what's the probability that you reach into these 500 kids and you pull out a junior. What's the probability to pull out a junior? Well, there's 155 juniors that could be picked out of 500. All right, awesome, easy. Sorry for my sloppy handwriting. But now I could get even like really more specific, right? I could say, all right, what's the probability that I get a junior and somebody who wears glasses, right? So I'm still picking out one kid, the chance event right? The random process is picking out one student. But now I'm looking for one student who needs to both be a junior and wear glasses. Well, there's only 32 kids that meet that. There's only 32 out of 500 kids that meet that qualification of being a junior and wearing glasses. Okay, now check this out. This is where it's going to get really interesting. What's the probability I get a junior or somebody who wears glasses? All right, this is where we got to say, okay. So remember, or means junior. So if you're a junior, 155 kids are juniors. Any one of those kids gets picked, I'm happy because I said junior or glasses. Or, so I'm going to add, if you're wearing glasses, 142 kids are wearing glasses. So 142 out of 500 are going to also meet my qualification because they are junior or glasses. You don't have to be both. So 155 kids are juniors. That's going to make me happy. 142 kids wear glasses. That's going to make me happy. But red alert, be careful. These 32 kids got double counted. Think about that for a second. Those 32 kids that are both glasses and juniors, 
they got counted amongst the 155 juniors. They also got counted amongst the 142 kids that wear glasses. Listen, those 32 kids deserve to be counted, but they don't deserve to be counted twice. So I actually have to subtract away the both, the 32 out of 500. Now, most kids will say at this point, whoa, whoa, Mr. Princhak, you are driving me crazy right now. This isn't making sense. You told me that or means A, B, but it also means both. So why am I subtracting the both? No, 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 no. I'm not getting rid of the both. I'm preventing them from being counted twice. So junior or glasses means that the juniors need to be included. So I included the 155 juniors. The kids that wear glasses need to be included. So the 142 kids that wear glasses need to be included. But by adding together the juniors and the glasses, I double counted the overlap. I double counted the both. The 32 kids who are both juniors and wearing glasses, they were included. They were included amongst 155 juniors and the 142 kids that wear glasses. And that's great, but they don't deserve to be counted twice. So I'm subtracting it away, not to get rid of them, to prevent them from being counted twice. So 155 plus 142 minus 32 is 265 total students out of 500 that will satisfy. 265 total students that are A, wearing glasses, or B, junior, but that 265 also does include the both, kids that are wearing glasses and are juniors. So this brings up a really important rule called the addition rule. The addition rule says that the probability of A or B equals the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B, which is literally what I just did, right? Juniors or glasses. So I started with, all right, what's the probability I get a junior? 155 out of 500. All right, what's the probability I get a kid that wears glasses? 142 out of 500. All right, I have to subtract away the and. We're not getting rid of the both. We're just stopping them from being counted twice. Now, recall if A and B are mutually exclusive, then there is no overlap. A and B equals zero. Now, one student can wear glasses and be a junior. So wearing glasses and being a junior are not mutually exclusive because the table showed me 32 kids were both a junior and they wore glasses. So those would not be mutually exclusive events. So I'm just kind of forewarning you that if you, if you don't have to worry about subtracting anything if they are mutually exclusive. You know, for example, if I said, what's the probability you toss a coin and you get a tail or a head? Well, that'd be 100%. You take 0.5 for the tail plus 0.5 for the head, add them together and you get one. You don't have to worry about subtracting anything away because it's impossible to get both at the same time. Now, another thing you're gonna notice here as well is that I have the, the addition rule written twice. You might be like, why'd you write it twice? Well, you know, mathematicians have to have symbols for everything. So a, this symbol, it looks like a U, it's actually not a U, it stands for union. This symbol looks like a U, I get it, is the mathematical symbol for or. So oftentimes you'll see that symbol here, that means or. And then an upside down U, which um, is the mathematical word for and. Again, just understand the math world, we got symbols for everything, right? So an upside down U, that is the mathematical word for and. So this is just another form of that addition rule, but using symbols instead of words. I like to use words, it's crystal clear, but I can't say you're never gonna see symbols on a test or quiz or anything like that. Now I wanna say this one more time. This is why the or formula is awesome, because on the left side, we have A or B. On the right side, we have A, we have B, we even have A and B which makes me understand that the opposite of A, A, A or B is neither. So once you find the probability of A or B, the opposite of that would be neither. So if I go back to this problem and I said, all right, hey, what's the probability that I pick a kid at random? Pick one random kid. That's my random process. That's my chance event, picking one student out of these 500. What's the probability that they neither, no, no junior, nor are they wearing glasses? Well, that would just be taking 100, um, excuse me, not 100. I'd be taking 500 minus 265. That would be the 235 kids. That would be neither. That would just be the opposite. That would be the not. No junior, not wearing glasses. That would be the 235 kids out of 500 that don't meet those qualifications. 
All right, so a lot going on there. Um, this is the end of part two. One more part for this particular topic. It's kind of a long one, but there's a lot of information when it comes to probability. So hopefully you guys understand. All right, see you in the next part.